Amen. Well, as we continue our worship, I would invite you to take your Bible with me and turn to John chapter 3 for this message entitled, All Glory Be to Christ. John chapter 3. Our text for today is John 3, verses 22 to 30. And in this text, we see the humility of John the Baptist as his ministry begins to fade into the shadows as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begins to rise. The primary lesson for you and me to draw from this passage is that our place in the kingdom of God is determined by the Lord. And when He chooses to reduce our role for the sake of accomplishing His greater purposes, rather than being jealous or resentful, we should give all glory to Christ. Follow along as I read John chapter 3, verses 22 to 30. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi... He who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bore me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's pray. Our Father, with this text open before us, we submit our minds and our hearts to what the Spirit would teach us today. Open our minds and illumine our hearts. Show us Christ. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Give hearing to deaf ears and sight to blind eyes and life to dead souls. We believe, Holy Spirit, that you and only you have the power to save and to, and to sanctify. And we pray that you would do that for the sake of Christ and the glory of his name. We pray. Amen. The limelight is an enticing place to be. Uh, The idol factory, otherwise known as the human heart, which collectively creates a culture, has always been prone to elevate certain individuals to a position that we would consider a celebrity. A celebrity is simply someone whose name is well known. They are a household name, and by virtue of being well-known, their lives garner a great amount of attention, whether they want it or not. We see this, of course, in every sphere of society. There are those world-renowned people, uh, artists, musicians who are known across culture, across languages that transcends land and every other barrier. But really, every corner of society, every subculture, every group that can be identified as a group in some way has their own celebrities those names and faces that are well-known within that group and venerated within that group. And this includes the church of Jesus Christ as well. This dynamic puts on display the sinfulness of the human heart. We who once were under the wrath and condemnation of the Father, destined to receive His just wrath forever, forever, 
but we were rescued and redeemed by the Son of God who gave His life for us. He paid the penalty that sinners deserve and purchased a people for His own possession, transforming them to present them to Himself in, in beauty and splendor and righteousness, that He might receive the glory and honor that is due to Him as the magnificent Savior forever and ever. And yet, the very people He redeems venerate and even divide themselves over which heralds of that gospel they prefer. When Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthian church to set them straight on a variety of matters, one of the first issues he addressed was their propensity to fight over their favorite apostolic leaders. He writes this in 1 Corinthians 1, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And then from there, he goes on this spirit-inspired rabbit trail for a couple chapters. And he comes back to this issue in chapter 3, and he says, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now, Paul has more to say on that topic, which you can read on your own, but for our purposes today, I just want to highlight that last statement. Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. In other words, those whom God uses to accomplish His purpose are nothing. Only God is something. Now, there's nothing we can do about celebrity culture. We can't change how other people think and how other people act. But we can examine our own hearts and guard against the two kinds of temptations that can rise up in our own hearts. First, all of us are tempted to idolize another person. We're tempted to give our hearts to someone whose abilities draw us to want to come or to want to consume uh, everything that they produce, books, sermons, uh, music, other things. And, and we overemphasize in our minds their strengths and we minimize to obscurity their weaknesses. We will turn off our discernment and accept everything they say as if it's inerrant. And should anybody dare to disagree with our favorite teacher, we will defend them to the end. We're fast friends with anyone who follows that same teacher, and we think less of those who don't. And when we encounter someone who's never heard of that teacher, we become quick evangelists, and we urge them to ask them into their heart by consuming everything that they have to offer. Some are so given over to that idolatry that should their favorite leader or teacher experience some scandal, true or false, they themselves will question their own faith because they were so dependent on that individual. This idolatry shows that we who are servants of Christ, we have that tendency to glorify servants of other servants of Christ when we should only glorify Christ. We need to guard against that temptation in our hearts. The second temptation that we need to guard against is the temptation that all who serve Christ in any capacity, we are tempted to elevate ourselves above being slaves of Christ. 
And you know that's happened in your heart when you have such a firm grip on the ministry that God has given to you that, that you refuse to let it go. Or you get jealous or resentful when someone else gets more attention and more opportunities than you. Or you feel threatened by others who might be more gifted than you. Or you convince yourself that God needs you in order to accomplish His purposes in that ministry. Or when your ministry comes to an end, for whatever reason, you feel as though you've lost your identity. This is what happens when we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, when we're more interested in our own glory, whether we're willing to admit it or not, than the glory of Christ. Well, as the Apostle John thought through what he would include in his gospel about the Lord Jesus Christ, as he set forth his case that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you might have life in His name, the Holy Spirit directed him to include this section on the John the Baptist. Why? Well, because John the Baptist, even though he died early on during the ministry of Christ, those who followed John the Baptist were still following John the Baptist decades after Jesus himself died and rose and ascended into heaven. And John, the apostle, wanted the followers of John the Baptist to know what their own leader thought about himself and about Christ. In chapter 1, we learn that John's wildly popular ministry reached its apex when Jesus came to him to be baptized, and John pointed him out and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the next day, he, Jesus came to him again, and, and John said, This is the Son of God. And as much as John was pointing people to Jesus as the Messiah, there were still people, even as we see in our own text, who had not yet transferred their allegiance from John to Jesus. And again, that remained true for years and the decades to follow. And so John includes this section, again, to tell anyone who would be following John the Baptist, as great as he was, that John himself would tell them, you need to follow Jesus. And instructive for us is how we should consider our own ministry when people are following us or how we should think about ourselves. As we consider this text, we're going to outline it uh, and walk through it under the following headings. Uh, simply the setting, the argument, the lesson, the illustration, and the application. We're just going to walk through verse by verse. Let's begin with the setting to understand what is going on here. Look at verses 22 to 24 with me. The, the Apostle John writes, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was, the water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Notice those first two words, after this. This clearly refers to the time that Jesus had spent in Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus would have been there for the better, better part of a week, perhaps a little bit more, and it was a busy week. He began that week, as we saw in chapter 2, uh, uh, cleansing the temple. And after that uh, uh, removing of the animals and the money changers, from the temple, he spent most of the rest of the week teaching and performing miracles. And then he celebrated the Passover. And either before the Passover or after the Passover, he had the interaction that he had with Nicodemus, which we studied last few messages in verses 1 to 21. So it was a busy week. After that busy week, Jesus and his small band of disciples, not yet the full 12 disciples, started to head back to Galilee, where it was uh, where Jesus' hometown was. But before they could get there, they would make a couple stops here, and as we'll see in chapter 4, in Samaria. And in this particular stop, they baptize people. Jesus, or rather the, the text says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. 
Your Bible might say the land of Judea, which would be a more literal rendering. Jerusalem itself is in the land of Judea. Judea, of course, being that region of the land of Israel that was entrusted, that was given as an inheritance to the tribe of Judah. So by saying that they went from Jerusalem, which is in the land of Judea, to the land of Judea, what John is implying is that they went to the outer edges, the countryside, if you will, of Judea. And since he was aiming to go north to Galilee, most likely he was on the eastern edge of Judea, which was going along the Jordan River, because that would be the easiest way to go all the way north to Galilee. And Jesus and his disciples, as they're making this trip, would not have been alone. There'd be uh, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of Jews who were also streaming out of Jerusalem, making their way back to Galilee or wherever else uh, they lived after the Passover. So when they reached a place of water, namely the Jordan River, Jesus decided to stop and baptize people. Remember that in chapter 2, verse 23, It says, now when he was in Jerusalem, speaking of Jesus here, at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Now, as we saw, that was not a genuine faith. That was a superficial faith. And yet, they believed sufficient to be baptized by Jesus. They would have heard of the the preaching of John the Baptist, that the Messiah was coming, and now the word would have spread that John himself had pointed out the Messiah, and then those who were in Jerusalem would have heard Jesus' teaching and experienced his miracles, so they were eager to be baptized by the Messiah. Why were they being baptized? Well, because John was a prophet of God, and he was proclaiming a message of repentance and baptism. It was a command of God through his prophet that you must be baptized to prepare for the Messiah. And so, naturally, in obedience to that message by the prophet, they were being baptized. And Jesus, as he began his ministry, was also preaching the same message, though he was speaking about himself, not some other Messiah, of course. Matthew 3.12 tells us the essence of John's preaching, where John preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then verses 5 to 6 there of Matthew 3 tells us the response that the people had to his preaching. It said, then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. That's what was happening before Jesus came. And then Matthew and Mark tell us the message that Jesus preached as he began his ministry, and they summarized it as, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the exact same message that John preached. So again, Jesus and John were baptizing in light of the message that had been given to John from God. The baptism that those people received was not the Christian baptism that you and I would be familiar with, where we symbolize unity with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. Rather, the baptism of John and Jesus symbolized the washing of sin and turning of hearts to the Lord in preparation for the Messiah's kingdom. Now, if you look at verse 22, and you notice that it says, and he remained there with them and was baptizing, the natural assumption is that Jesus himself would be doing the baptizing. But John clarifies this in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, if you just scan your eyes down there. It says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he says, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Why didn't Jesus personally baptize anybody? Well, Scripture doesn't tell us, but I believe it's because Jesus knows the human heart. Can you imagine the pride that people would have if Jesus, the Messiah, baptized them? I mean, there'd be a crowd of people gathered together, and one person would say, oh, I was baptized by one of the disciples of John. Somebody else says, I was baptized by John himself. Somebody else, I was baptized by a disciple of Jesus. You think you got a story. <laughs> I was baptized by Jesus. I mean, there are many today who think it's something special to be baptized in the Jordan River itself. Can you imagine how great of a temptation it would be to be filled with pride if Jesus baptized you? So Jesus knows mankind all too well to baptize anyone, so he has his disciples do it. 
Well, look at verse 23. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. Now, we don't know where either of these cities are for certain, but archaeologists' best guess is that Anon and Salim are in the northeast corner of Samaria, really between Samaria and Galilee, not far from the west bank of the Jordan River. Whether John himself went to Jerusalem for the Passover, we don't know, but he and his disciples had moved at some point from uh, the southern part of the Jordan River uh, further north uh, into this area. Now, verse 24 tells us the rather obvious fact that John had not yet been put in prison. He couldn't well be baptizing people if he was locked up in a cell in prison. So why does John tell us this? Well, it's because if you were to read the other Gospels which were written first, you would assume that in light of everything that John has been telling us so far in his Gospel, that John the Baptist had long since been put in prison. In fact, if you read the other Gospels, the implication is that as soon as Jesus was baptized and went into the wilderness for 40 days, that John was put in prison almost immediately after that. I mean, listen how, to how tightly Mark puts this in Mark chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He says, And Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Matthew essentially communicates the same thing in his gospel. So, again, if you're reading those gospels, you would assume that as soon as Jesus came out of the wilderness, John was summarily arrested and put in prison. But John tells us that when Jesus came out of the wilderness, he went up to Cana in Galilee for a wedding. Then he went over to Capernaum and spent a few days there. And then he went down to Jerusalem for the Passover. So how do these things fit together? How, how do we know that there was all these things that took place in, in that period of time? Well, the simple fact is the other Gospels just plain skipped all of what John tells us in chapter 2 and 3 of his Gospel. So there was a time when the ministries of John and the ministry of Jesus were running parallel to one another, though it was a rather short period of time, and that's what the rest of this passage tells us. So here we have Jesus on the southern part of the Jordan River baptizing. We have John further north off of the, north, uh, off of the Jordan River baptizing. This is the setting, which brings us to the argument. Look at verses 25 and 26. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who was... He who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. The word discussion there in verse 25 is too tame. Out of the seven times that this word is used in the New Testament, it's most often translated as debate or controversy. So you could say a squabble arose, an argument erupted, a theological debate ensued. And much to our disappointment, John does not tell us almost anything about this. He only gives us a reference to who was debating and a one-word description of the topic itself. He says here that the people arguing were John's disciples and a Jew. This is a particular way, or a peculiar way of describing the people involved in the argument because John's disciples were Jews, as were, of course, the majority of people in Israel. So this at least tells us that John's disciples were not arguing with a Gentile. They were not arguing with a Samaritan. In this gospel, we'll often hear John referring to the Jews, plural, as a reference to those antagonistic Jewish leaders. But here, his disciples are arguing with a Jew, singular. So what does that mean? Well, it means that their argument was with an average person on the street, if you will. It wasn't an argument with religious leaders. It wasn't an argument with the Pharisees or political leaders, the Sadducees. It's just an argument among common Israelites. So, whatever the argument was about, it wasn't a topic that was, that was a concern for the theologically trained. It wasn't a, an esoteric theological debate. 
What was the topic? Well, John says there at the end of verse 25, they were debating over purification. Now, that could mean all kinds of things. The Mosaic Law has a variety of laws and instructions of how to purify objects and people for the purpose of ritual cleansing and proper worship. Those would be things that the scribes and the lawyers would be concerned about. Beyond that, Israel had de- uh, developed various uh, traditions uh, and practices related to just life cleans- cleansing, uh, cleansing, such as washing of hands before meals. Those were the kinds of things that the Pharisees were very concerned about. But then there's John's baptism, which was a baptism for repentance, representing cleansing from sin in preparation for the coming Messiah. And that was something that the people themselves were concerned about. So what aspect of purification were they debating? Well, perhaps verse 26 will give us a clue. It says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. Now, perhaps you're like most interpreters and you're wondering, what in the world does that have to do with purification? In fact, most would treat verse 25 and verse 26 as completely unrelated statements. But given the intense purposefulness of John's gospel, that seems rather unlikely, and especially since verse 26 begins both in English and in the Greek with the word and. In other words, John attaches verse 26 to verse 25, or rather those two sentences since the verse numbers came later. So it's up to us, the reader, the student of Scripture, to discern that connection. Well, whatever the argument was, they came to John because they considered considered him to be a respected teacher. That's what rabbi means. And they wanted to get his answer to the question that they've been discussing. And the way they present the dilemma is to point out that Jesus is baptizing and all, they say, are going to him. So what does that mean? It means that people are not choosing to be baptized by John. I mean, think about this. John is the first true prophet from God in over 400 years. And while we don't know when precisely he began his ministry, it doesn't seem like it was all that long ago, almost certainly less than five years ago, maybe less than three or two years ago. And then during that time, thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of people were coming to him to be baptized and to hear him preach. And now, just a short time after he began his ministry, the crowds were thinning out considerably and they were less interested in his preaching. As a prophet of God, he was was proclaiming a message from God and commanding the people to repent and be baptized, but now people are turning away from him and following someone else. So as a devoted follower of John, as his disciples were, this was deeply concerning. They were zealous for God and his righteousness. They were ready to receive the kingdom of God and the coming of the Messiah. And maybe, just maybe, if they were like the disciples of Jesus, maybe they thought by being attached to John, they would have an elevated position in the kingdom of God. But now they they see their leader, the prophet John, and his ministry is being diminished. We can't be certain, but based on what they said to John, perhaps the argument had to do with whether or not it was necessary to be baptized by John to sufficiently fulfill the command of God, or whether being baptized with Jesus was acceptable. Maybe this particular Jew was walking by, and the disciples of John called out to him, hey, come over here, be baptized, repent and be baptized. And the man says to them something like, oh, that's okay, I've already been baptized by Jesus. And they say, you need to be baptized by John. And so the argument ensues. And so they come to John, and they say, look, Jesus is baptizing, and all are going to him. As if to say, what are you going to do about this, John? Well, again, we can't be completely certain, but it seems as though Jesus was baptizing too far away for them to physically see him. So it may be that there were many people coming by John and his disciples who had just been baptized by Jesus a day or two before. Whatever the case, these loyal disciples of John were deeply concerned that John's ministry 
was no longer being taken seriously and his message was no longer being heard and ultimately his influence was waning. Well, that brings us to the lesson. Look at verses 27 and 28. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bore me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. In this simple statement, John models for us how our view of God is the most important thing about us. His response to what is going on is centered around God and his purposes. He has no interest in preserving his popularity or having a tight grip on his ministry. He's concerned with one and only one thing, fulfilling God's purpose for his life. It's critical that you and I set this foundation stone in our lives. Look again at this God-centered principle in verse 20, 27. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. What does this mean? It simply means this. You and I are such dependent creatures that we cannot do the most basic thing for ourselves. If our life depended on our own ability to do anything, we would die instantly. We are, understand this, you and I are just as dependent as a newborn baby. What can a newborn baby do and provide for itself? Nothing. It can't clean itself. It can't change itself. It, it can't feed itself. It, it can't even tell anybody what it needs. A, a newborn baby in any position is like a turtle turned over on its back. No matter how much it flails, it's not going anywhere. A newborn baby is utterly dependent on others for its survival. And maybe you're thinking, what do you mean? I, I can feed myself. I can clean myself. I can move around. I can work. I can earn a living. I'm not dependent like a newborn baby. Well, we're all thankful that we can do those things. But consider this. Do you... Do you keep your heart beating? Do you keep your lungs breathing? Do you command your, your blood to flow and be refreshed with oxygen and carry it throughout your body? Do, do you direct the synapses in your brain to fire and carry those messages throughout your body? Do you keep your memory logs in order? I know you don't. I know I don't. With every step, do you consciously control your muscles so that they engage and disengage just right to make smooth movements? Do you tell your stomach how to filter the food that you eat and split the molecules to ensure that the nutrients are retained and the waste is passed along? I mean, we could go on and on. And even if you had the ability to keep yourself alive by, the, by sheer will, and cause your body to function, you would still be utterly dependent. I mean, did you decide when in history you would be born? Did you determine into whose family you would be born? Did you decide how you would be educated as a child? Did you give yourself your personality or upon salvation take for yourself spiritual gifts that you would have? Can you control your employment or ministry opportunities that, that come your way and guarantee that you get the ones that you want? Can you ensure that the that people around you respond to the things that you say the way you think they should respond or do the things that you think they should do? 
your life from the very physiological functioning to the, the circumstances and relationships and opportunities are not of your own ability to determine. They are all from God in heaven. No one has the ability to receive not one thing. That's what it literally says. Unless it is given him from heaven. There is nothing that you have. There is nothing that you are. There is nothing you've accomplished which was not given to you. Your life, your strength, your intellect, your personality, your opportunities, your accomplishments, your ministry, it all comes from the Lord who is the sovereign king of heaven and the giver of all good things. Even as James 1.17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This is true of all of our service to the Lord. Do you serve as a greeter in the church? That is a gift from the Lord. Do you serve as a worker in the nursery? That is a gift from the Lord. Do you teach those three-year-olds that can't sit still and you're not sure if they understand? That is a gift from the Lord. Do you teach teenagers? That is a gift from the Lord. Do you serve the body by cleaning up the facility or building the facility? That's a gift from the Lord. Do you serve as a small group leader or a growing disciples teacher or a ministry leader or a deacon or an elder? That's a gift from the Lord. God owes us nothing and we deserve nothing. All that we are and all that we have is a gift from the Lord. This means that when our ministry changes, when our position is given to someone else, when someone more gifted uh, rises to prominence, or when our ministry comes to an end, we can only say with Job, the Lord is given, the Lord is taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. John understood his role. He understood that it was, that it was narrow and temporary. He had been given an assignment from the Lord, and that assignment did not include ever-increasing popularity. Look again at verse 28. He says, You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before me, or rather before him. He reminds his disciples there that his message has been clear and consistent in his preaching that he himself is not the Messiah. He is not the one to whom people should be giving their allegiance. His role was simply to, to prepare the people and point to the arrival of the Messiah. Really, the role of John the Baptist is the same role that every Christian has, and that is to declare, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Whatever you or I do to serve the Lord, it would be a travesty if we got the idea in our head and in any way communicated to others, it's all about me. This is my ministry. I'm in charge. Everyone has to follow me. Oh, no. We, we are stewards. And there is nothing more wretched than a steward who thinks himself to be the king. So whether you vacuum after church or you preach from the pulpit or anything in between, we are all slaves of Christ and stewards of his gifts. Sometimes he gives us opportunities to serve in ways that excite us. Sometimes he gives us opportunities in ways that don't excite us. But what is required of stewards, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.2, is that they be found faithful. John the Baptist was a faithful steward. And because he understood the stewardship that was entrusted to him, he was not bothered that many people were going 
to Jesus. In fact, he was excited. And so to emphasize this lesson and his own personal disposition, he moves from the lesson to the illustration. Look at verse 29. He says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. This is a perfect illustration, and its meaning is even beyond what John the Baptist understood. But before your mind goes to the apostolic teaching that the church is the bride of Christ, remember that John the Baptist knows nothing about the church. He'll be in heaven before Jesus begins to teach about the church, and certainly before the church is born in Acts 2. So in his mind, he's simply using a crystal clear illustration to make his point. But as is often the case with the prophets, He spoke truths that he didn't fully understand. So let's begin with John's intended meaning here. He begins with the obvious. At a wedding, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. Everybody at the wedding, including the wedding party, understands the primacy and the exclusivity of the relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. For a a, a friend to stand between them or alongside them as a third wheel, if you will, is unthinkable. In fact, even worse, if if a friend were to try and take the bride from the bridegroom, that would bring shame upon himself, and if he was successful, shame upon the families that were there to celebrate. Now, perhaps you remember the words of the Book of Common Prayer, which is the book that contains the liturgies that Christians have used throughout the centuries, and We hear these familiar words as part of the marriage ceremony. Should anyone present know of any reason that this couple should not be joined together in holy matrimony, speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, to an ancient Jew who practiced arranged marriages, to say that at a wedding would be outrageous. First of all, no one but the parents have a say in the marriage of their kids. But second, by the time of the wedding, the couple had already been legally betrothed. So John asserts the obvious truth that at a wedding, the the bride belongs to the bridegroom, which no one can take from him. Now, we have very little historical evidence of what actually took place in the wedding ceremonies of that day in Israel. But a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 25 gives us a hint that what would often happen, it seems, is the bridegroom would go to the bride's house and bring her back to his house for the celebration in in some kind of a parade. And the friend of the bridegroom may well have been the one responsible to set up the arrangements for the celebration, so he would be waiting for the bridegroom to arrive with the bride, and so he would be listening for the voice of the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom's job was singular. It was privileged and it was exciting. His job was to set the celebratory tone of the wedding in demonstrating the joy and the excitement of seeing his friend and his friend's bride arriving together. And then as he observes the finalization of the marriage, he rejoices with exceeding joy at the blessing of God upon his friend. So how shameful would it be? If everyone is celebrating the wedding and the marriage, and the best man is off in the corner, sulking, somebody goes to him and says, what's wrong? He says, why is everybody paying attention to him? Oh, what a fool he would be. Yet this is how John's disciples felt. And if we're honest, sometimes we can feel this way with others. They, the disciples of John, took offense on behalf of the friend of the bridegroom when when they should have been celebrating, but not John. John took no offense. He says there at the end, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. His eyes were fixated on fulfilling his mission. Therefore, his heart was full of joy at the coming of Jesus. And the more people that went to Jesus, the more successful John's ministry was and the more joy that he had. And as long as people were still following John while Jesus walked around Israel, John's ministry was not yet complete. His mission was to work himself out of a ministry. 
to, to point people to Jesus so that they would stop following John and instead follow Jesus. Now, in this illustration, John refers to himself as the friend of the bridegroom. But let's take a step further based on what later Scripture reveals. What, what John didn't know is that marriage itself is not just a helpful illustration to make his point, but rather God designed marriage as a precursor, as a shadow, as a forerunner, if you will, to the relationship between Jesus the Christ and His people, the church. Just as John himself was the forerunner, preparing people for and then pointing to Jesus, so marriage is meant to help us understand and point to Jesus. Keep your finger here and turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, this this is not the only passage that teaches this, but it certainly is the most extensive. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. The Apostle Paul is talking about marriage, and he says this in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Quoting from Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then Paul concludes, This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. With Jesus as the husband, you and I are the wife in this relationship. And did you catch what our responsibility is? It is to submit to Christ in everything. And did you know what makes submitting to Christ so wonderful? He loves us. He gave himself for us. He forgives us. He cares for us just as he cares for himself. He nourishes us and he cherishes us and he thinks of us as his own. You know what that means? That means that when he provides a ministry for you, it is perfectly suited for your good and his glory. And when he takes a ministry away from you, he does it for your good and his glory, because he only does what is good for us. Our all-knowing and all-wise and all-loving bridegroom knows what is best. He is the perfect leader, so we can trust that if he chooses to bless someone else in, in a way that our own ministry is diminished, we can rejoice. If he chooses to take ministry off of our plate for whatever reason, We can rejoice. That is the illustration. We've walked through this passage looking at the setting, the argument, the lesson, and the illustration. We come now to the application. Back at John chapter 3, look at verse 30. He concludes, He must increase, but I must decrease. After declaring the truth that You can receive nothing unless it is given to you by God and the truth that the people ought to follow the Messiah, not him. John's application is that the Christ must increase. He must become greater. He must become more important. His ministry must grow. His influence must multiply, while John's ministry must decrease. He must diminish in importance. His ministry must fade and his influence wane. He must increase, but I must decrease. You could more literally translate that. It 
is necessary. That for that one, him, to increase, but for me to decrease. It's not that that should happen. It's not that it would be good for him to increase. No, he ought to increase. It is necessary that I decrease. This must happen because of who he is and who I am. This is required. This is of absolute necessity that he increase and that I decrease. It cannot be any other way. To borrow a term from A.W. Tozer, this is graduate level grace. To have the humility to step aside after enjoying such a profound and popular ministry and let all the attention go to someone else, even if it is the Messiah himself, that is only possible if the grace of God is at work in your heart. I mean, John was born for this ministry. His his ministry was prophesied in Isaiah 40 and Malachi 4. His birth and his life purpose was pronounced by an angel to his parents. Jesus himself would say of John, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. He was born when his parents were old, and once they died, he lived his life wandering in the wilderness until the Spirit led him to begin his preaching and baptizing ministry. His whole life led up to a ministry that exploded in popularity. But now, just one, two, three years later, it was fading to nothing. And John's mindset was, that's the way it should be. And why should it be that way? Because that's what God ordained for me. This is what he's given me, not more, and not less. Beloved, the rise and fall of your ministry, however significant you perceive it to be, is determined in heaven. This doesn't just apply to to prophets and apostles or pastors. This applies to all of us who serve the Lord in any capacity. Whatever you do, whatever position you hold in the life of the church, whatever gifts you hold, or rather have, we must all hold our ministry with an open hand. And our goal should be to see Christ glorified. Whatever opportunities you have were given from heaven so that all glory would be to Christ. Whatever gifts and abilities you were given were given to you from heaven so that all glory would be to Christ Whatever apparent success you experience comes from heaven so that all glory would be to Christ. And if our ministry is taken away, we can rejoice because it's all about Christ and not about us. And when we reach the limits of our gifts or our abilities begin to fade and diminish, We can rejoice because it's all about Christ and not about us. And when the success that we've experienced vanishes and we stop seeing any fruit, we can rejoice because it's all about Christ and it's not about us. For the redeemed servant of Christ, our attitude should be that of the psalmist when he wrote in Psalm 84.10, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. There is no position too low. There is no outpost too far. There is no task too difficult, no recognition too little. Because from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. We are slaves and stewards of His kingdom. So Jesus tells us in Luke 17, so you also, when you have done all that you have been commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. 
that should be our attitude, knowing that the master, for his part, will say to his faithful stewards one day, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for John the Baptist. It's obvious that you worked powerfully in him. You didn't just give him a message which he proclaimed, but you granted him the grace and the strength to carry out that message, even in the face of opposition. More than that, you gave him the grace to remember his station, that he was your servant, and that Christ is all. Or would you help us in our own hearts? Many of us serve in many capacities in this church. We have many leaders, many, many servants who do big things, who do little things, those who are known, those who are unknown, people who are up front, people who are behind the curtain. Lord, you know our hearts and our temptations. You know the ways in which we're tempted to think more of ourselves than we ought to think or wish that we got more recognition than we did or that we saw more fruit from our ministry than we see. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to be faithful with what you've entrusted to us and to give all glory to Christ. For his sake I pray, amen.